Hi, this is Emily. Welcome to my channel. I'm here today to do a detailed review with some reading snippets from this book, Ice Fields by Thomas Wharton. This book was written in 1995. It is an award-winning book in Canada. It won multiple Canadian awards and an Caribbean award. Other awards I can't even remember. Um, it has been on my reading list for quite some time. I was saving it for these snowy months of um, February. Um, this copy I found secondhand on eBay. I cannot find a modern, um, Amazon has a couple of copies, but they're, they're through secondhand sellers. So I don't know if it's not in current publication or what's going on. It's definitely worth trying to pick it up through Amazon through secondhand seller if you can, because the price is a little better. <laughs> um, but this book was unique and there's some things I need to warn you about and tell you about and, um, different you know, different. Like I wanted winter reads. I wanted wintry, chilly, frosty, glittering, sparkling, dazzling, icy, crystallized, you know, books. And this fits the bill because this is called Ice Fields. <laughs> so first I'll tell you a little bit what the book's about. Then we'll talk about some of the underlying themes of the book. We'll talk about um, some of uh, the, the things that I found difficult about it. Some warnings. First thing I'll actually tell you before I go into what the book is about is this book is written in short, fragmented narrative prose. The prose is lovely, beautiful, and flows. Yes, and that could be where the award-winning part comes in. And there are it, it is done in short little fragments, which makes it easy to read real quick, really quickly. So if you see here, like we have a 10, we have 11. It's like super short super short we have 12 we have 13 so it's like you feel like you can get through this book really quickly the book though is written like a narrative like the man dr Byrne, is telling his story almost in this book he does do some diary entries or journal entries and it's and it'll say entry number blah 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 but the rest of it when it's just narrative feels like it's still the diary entry um, it's, but I love, I do love the fact that it's short and fragmented, but the short fragments, the little sections are impactful. They really pack a punch. Like every little fragment, every word has a purpose. Every sentence builds something, shows something. There's not, there's more showing and less telling, which is important in, uh, literature. Um, and it's oddly, very briefly in each little fragment, engaging and, and addictive. It's, it's, it's not like anything I've ever read. Um, so this book is about Dr. Byrne. He's English. He, it, this is basically about a group of people who come together at the end of the 1800s, just before the turn of the century, 1900, um, to, um, the, the coldest part of Canada, I guess it is, where the Al, Al, how do you pronounce it? The Al, Albatus, Albatus Glacier or something like is where all the ice fields are up there, um, which was a lot more ice a hundred something years ago. Um, they're explorers and they go up there in the summer. It's still ice, but it's habitable enough so you can be up there without it killing you. They're up there exploring. They're doing scientific experiments. Um, measuring glaciers, studying glaciers, glace, glaciology kind of science, that kind of thing. There's a group of, you know, five or six of them. They go up there. There's an accident. Um, Dr. Byrne, he basically falls into a crevice between two, like, icebergs, falls into the crevice. All of the crew members, I think, were tied together. But he falls in way down between the ice plates and glitter, you know, sharp blue razor-ish ice. And he's dangling upside down for a good period of time while they're trying to rescue him. And when he's dangling upside down in the ice, it is a meditative moment. But either way, when he's down there, he sees something almost supernatural, like something in the ice that does not belong there, that it makes you wonder, was he imagining it because he's nearly freezing while he's waiting to be rescued because he, the blood's rushing to his head, but he clearly sees it and it outlines very perfectly what it is in this book and something in the way in the crevice of the ice. 
and he knows he saw it and he does get rescued he gets brought down to a cabin of some indigenous woman to to get rehabilitated you know because have frostbite and whatever um and you know basically throughout the book he comes he goes back to london he comes back every year i guess it's like every summer which is still icy you know you're still up like in the, Ar the arctic but it's not like blowing snow i mean you're still gonna you can go out and do your experiments and stuff on the ice but he goes back every year for like 30 years i think it's 25 to 30 years in this book he goes back to f try to find what he had seen when he fell into the crack so it's an adventure exploration theme in here um almost like an obsession and he doesn't really ever tell anyone about it because he thinks no one will believe him um however some of the original glaciologists and our explorers that were up there at that time period come back and they come together at this lodge uh, every year and they go and they all do their own things and through this book um we see as it gets into the 19 teens 19 almost 1920s we see um you know the boom of, of the beginnings of uh, industrialization modernism capitalism um the the first town being put up the tourists coming you know we, we move into this period of I don't want to say pioneer because we're not out west, but if you compare it to like pioneer to now booming city, we kind of see like modernism, the whole theme of modernism coming to light as an underlying parallel um, to his story, um, even all the way into World War One, And we see how that changes things. And we see different kinds of sh like shops that go up and people come from all over the world um, and, and to see this town. And there's a beautiful description of that, which I will read keep getting texts here for my son um interesting but basically this book is about the things we think about when we think about ice that's the best way i can describe it the beauty of ice the importance of ice on our planet if you were in a glacier if you're on a glacier making you realize how small you are in this world compared to the the just brilliant part of nature that just makes us seem like tiny meaningless little <laughs> amoebas you know like it it's how ice can transform you spiritually to connect to the earth or god or spirit or mother nature whatever you want to call it how it really makes you evaluate your your life tap into your soul um so i i do really enjoy that aspect of it we see all that not only through the character of Dr. Byrne and through the narration, the narrator, which is Dr. Byrne with the narrator's voice, but it makes you feel that within yourself and think of that as well. And so it's really interesting how it pulls you in and you're like right alongside him having your own revelations and explorations and life changing moments. So that was really interesting. Um, uh, there's an underlying theme here, too, of uh, global warming. Uh, you know, we see over time as he's trying to find this place where he'd fall into the ice every year, you know, the ice moves. So that crevice that was there, which after he had fallen in, he marked it. And he goes back every year and tries to find those original ways he marked it, which he doesn't find until almost 20-something years later. Because the ice moved in a way that revealed this area again, like fresh snow covers it up. Uh, the ice moves the crevice comes together or they they move but somehow like by him tracking the movement of glaciers where it should be at per time period he finds that area again sort of um by then there's tourists coming up they're getting brought up to the glaciers it's not this rustic almost pioneerish um you know wild wild living like it was early in the book and it's and now there's buses of tourists going up there and it's it's hard for him to go back to that but but i can tell you for a fact i'm not going to tell you what happens but when, i can tell you for a fact the ending was literally out loud when i realized it was the last page i said uh, what the hell <laughs> like what the hell like that's the end like what <laughs> like it was like literally i said that out loud like what the hell that's the end like i don't know if it was like inconclusive or was it unsatisfying or was it, I, I didn't understand or all the above i was like I, I, 
it was very mysterious. One of those endings, like in Virginia Woolf's Mrs. Dalloway, where she swims out into the water, looking on the shore at her mansion or whatever, where the party's brewing. And whereas I, I believe it is at least my literary professors, but uh, uh, Virginia, Virginia Woolf wanted the reader to believe that this character was going to go drown herself, commit suicide, and then the book just ends. We just see her out in the water looking back, having thoughts about her life and having realizations, and it ends. I wrote an essay when I was doing my undergraduate degree in literature in my, um, <laughs> my uh, modernism literature course. Um, I read this book that I believe at the ending she swam back, that she... And I remember getting pulled into my professor's office saying out of the entire class, I was the only one he's ever seen who was in denial of the ending. And he thought it was fascinating that I deeply analyzed <clears throat> the, the way the novel was written and had a whole different take on the character's point of view and what could, really was going to occur that you didn't see at the end. And he was fascinating. He, he talked to me about it for like two hours. And so I thought that was pretty cool. And that was like, in, I was 18 years ago, you know, when I did my undergrad. So, uh, but I remember I felt like she went out there, she swam, she was just trying to escape. She had thoughts. She had a clarity of realization. She released some things. She was one with nature and she went back to her, you know, crummy, suppressed, suffocating life. It's not really clear she killed herself. Just saying. Um, so anyway, that's kind of what happened in this book. I was like, what? What is that supposed to mean? Like, so just be prepared. There's, a, uh, I have a few interpretations of it, but I can't really discuss that because you haven't read the book. So um, there is an underlying spiritual spirituality theme, I think, <laughs> I guess. Um, but what now to talk about the parts of this book, I have to tell you, every book, no book is perfect. Maybe some are perfect. Everyone thinks they have a perfect book. I always, you know, I'm a writer. I'm a literature professor. I always see some kind of problem. Character development. Because this is told in short, fragmented narrative style uh, and prose with, from the perspective of this one doctor, there are the other characters. There's Freya, um, a girl, there's another gal there, there's a couple of guys there that are up there for different reasons. One is like a trapper, one is a scientist, one is up there growing, trying to grow plants, one runs a lodge, and he comes across his characters every year, all the years he goes back, and they meet up at this lodge. There's no real character development. I had a painful time keeping track of these five, five people, who is who, because you can never get a visual on them. There's no real, very little, like, like sometimes you don't even know which character he's observing or talking to. And you, I, I didn't know half the time, like, there's no real description, like, of, of what they look like. You can't really get a visual on them. One, one of the characters dies, two of them die, but one of them dies, one of, one of the a few women that are there toward the end and I, I could not even feel anything because I couldn't get a visual on, on which one she was like I had to like go back to the book and there's so many little fragments you can't really find I she you know like I couldn't I didn't have a visual what she looked like I didn't remember anything about her like be, because this, the, the story isn't about the people it's about the ice and the spiritual journey and the, the adventure discovery but and there's no real dialogue. This shows you how important the dialogue is. There is no official properly written dialogue where two characters speaking with quotes around line, 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 this character, that character, this character, that character, he said, she said. No quotes in the entire book. The dialogue, when there is dialogue in the very, very brief snippets, have dashes. So here we go. The second vision was a grail. And then we have here, if you can see this, this dash. You are Irish, I think. She sat on a pinter in the doorway. And then we have, I was born in Dublin. And we see these dashes. So there's no quotes. And you only have about one, two, four to five 
back and forth tops, and then we're into a long narrative stretch again. So the dialogue is occasionally just put in there to not be the focus of the book. Just, it's almost like he's writing his diary. I, I said to her this in my diary, she, and her reply was this, and then you move on to com continue your story. It's really unusual. I've never seen anything like it ever. Um, let's see if I can get another example here. I'm going to read you some quotes so that are amazing. Um, like here we have all this narrative, narrative, and then we have a quick dash. There are no doctors here, Sarah said, but there's no quotes. It's a character saying something is third person perspective saying she said it, but it, they don't put in the quotes that she said it. So it's basically like the dialogue isn't happening live back and forth, which is what the quotation marks usually would represent. It's more like, He's writing what a person said, but not like they're actually saying it now. So there's no quotations around it. It's, it's very odd. But the downfall of this technique is character development is difficult um, because you don't really hear them talk enough. You don't see them much. There's not a lot of description of them. It's hard to follow who is who. It got very confusing and the sun is moving to cut into these blinds. So don't expect to get attached to any characters even dr burn is like a fly on the wall like you don't feel an attachment or interest to him the whole purpose of this writing style is to fall in love like the the ice is the character the journey is the character the people are the storytellers they the book is not about them really that's the only way i know how to describe it but let me just read a, a quick glimpse or two before the sun comes in and uh wrecks this video <laughs> uh let's take a look see like, what do i have here i wrote down my favorite quotes <laughs> laws of beautiful descriptions of ice when the dam bursts slabs of blue ice tumble down the swollen river surfacing and diving like sapphire dolphins trees were sheared off the crumbling banks further down the valley in jasper the ground buckled indoors no longer closed Headstones in the cemetery sink into the spongy earth. The ends of coffins row up like prose of sinking ships. The Anglican church, a hopeful wooden structure, collapsed during the first night of the flood. In the morning, the townspeople found a saint standing in the river, grounded upright on a gravel bar. The wooden statue wobbled unsteadily in the Russian current. Birds perched on its outstretched nut brown arms. There's a flood in there. Um, here we get into talking about the modernization, the capitalism, um, way, way into the book as, you know, 20 something years goes by, um, freight trains carrying fabrics and spices from Asia rocket through the valley, leaving an imagined perfume of the Orient in there, awake, electric lamps lying, lining the main boulevard, not yet paved. It must be admitted, but ladies with parasols and gentlemen in white suits will soon stroll here, which they do later in the book. The days when savage men wrestled with grizzly bears or were said to have done so has long vanished in the glow of these electric street lamps. And in this new age, for good or ill, women attempt fields of endeavor, feats of endeavor that were once reserved only for men, such as mountain climbing. So there's just pages of description of the of the capitalism and the industrialization and the inhabitants of the people coming, the time period, the costume of the time. Um, really, I really enjoyed that. Uh, um, reads like a historical fiction novel. Um, let's see. Stones, fragments of a lost continent come alive, scattered in the dirty snow of the till plain. Eye shadow palette at my feet, the mad artist having just walked away. Gray flecks with acid green and primrose yellow pockmarked slabs into which powers of burnt sienna had been ground. The many colored constellations of lichen growth, rocks splattered with alizarian crimson and cadmium orange, the purple and white veins of limestone. The enchantment of these mute fragments is undeniable. The bewitching garden of sins. Down among the cool stones, one might not perceive the burning rays of sunlight reflected from lingering patches of summer snow until it's too late. Love it. Beautiful, beautiful nature descriptions. I have to admit that is the what I love about this book. Absolutely amazing writing. Um, let's see what else. Dun, 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 dun. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. 
this is interesting. The ice field is the source of several major river systems and a storehouse of fresh water. The layers of deep ice within the field may be hundreds of years old, swarmed from new snow that fell here before the discovery of America, before the birth of Shakespeare, before the Industrial Revolution, the land we call Europe, before that time, a tropical jungle inhabited by elephants, enormous reptiles, and gigantic tires was swiftly buried beneath a great sheet of ice covering valleys, plateaus, and mountains. Overall, descendants, the silence of death upon the earth. The rays of the sun shining down on a frozen world were met only by the streak of wind on the groaning of crevices of the yard open across the surface of this now vast ocean of ice. So beautiful. The writing is wor it's worth reading for, for that. Beautiful descriptive writing. Love it. it, it highly recommended. Um... And just if you want to read a book that is told in a short narrative fragmented prose, it's very unique. And I think if you're interested in literature, different kinds of literature, this is a good read. Very good read. Um, it, if you ever go to visit an iceberg, it will probably make you think of this book. You'll never look at it the same again. Uh, any other thoughts I wrote down about this book? Um, yeah, all these members are part of the Royal Geographical Society. That's why they go there every year to do studies. Uh, let's see. A lot of scientific experiments happening with the ice. A lot of World War World War One flashbacks. The characters go back there after the war. A lot of dark scenes about the war of and memory. Um, we have. Here's the scene where he falls into the crevice. I closed my eyes and then I was upside down again, hanging in the crevice. A graceful, emotionless figure there before me. All around us, silence and stillness, the meditation of ice and rock. Um, yeah, so beautiful, beautiful book. Thomas Wharton, Ice Fields. Quick read. Um, just, you know, it's fiction based on a real location, based on some stories of some maybe similarish people but don't expect it to read like a novel because it's not a novel even though there's characters in it and don't you know it's very confusing you know the first the first like section number two the, the third page dark was rising in the valley and with it a liquid chill to the air where was trask he saw the lights who is Trask? And then they talk about this guy named Tom. Like they're talking about people they haven't even shown. And then suddenly he's on a trail with someone and now it's Trask. But they didn't really introduce that character of Trask. Like you you didn't see what he looks like, what he does. Like it's very, very little bits of character put in there. It's That is the only complaint I have. Thank you so much for watching. The sun is a killer. It's right about sunset time. So I'm going to have to close these blinds. I will link this below any copies that I find. I hope you enjoy it. Please tell me what you think. If you do read it, I would love to hear your comments and I'll see you in the next video.